Bonjour. Here's today's biology podcast. And as you should already know by now, we're going to be talking about gene control in eukaryotes. So let's start by looking at a eukaryote cell and how that's different from a prokaryote cell. Well, we've already talked about the fact that a prokaryote is a cell that doesn't have a proper nucleus, so it doesn't have a nuclear membrane, or otherwise called a nuclear envelope. Whereas a eukaryote cell does have a nucleus, and it does have a nuclear envelope surrounding the genetic material. Prokaryotes are also always single-celled organisms. Whereas eukaryotes can be single-celled organisms, but also multicellular organisms, like humans. In terms of the learning we've done so far on genetics and gene control, we've learned about prokaryotes controlling their DNA or the gene expression using operons. That's something that's unique to prokaryotes and eukaryotes don't have operons. So eukaryotes do it in a different way. And that's what we're going to learn about today. It is worth acknowledging that although prokaryote gene expression is quite well understood and the operon model has had lots of work and research done on it, Eukaryote control is not quite as well understood, and it's actually a little bit more complex. That doesn't necessarily mean it's more difficult to learn, though, so just stick with us, and it should be fine. It is also a rapidly growing field of biology, and there's lots of new research being done into this, and ultimately it, le- it could lead to cures for things like the AIDS virus and all kinds of stuff, so it's really sort of cutting-edge part of biology. So let's have a think about eukaryote cells and the way that they actually do control their gene expression. Well, first of all, just like prokaryote cells that we've looked at, they obviously don't need to express some genes all the time. So the example we looked at with prokaryotes was they're producing the uh, enzymes required to break down lactose. They're not required all the time, so the cells only need to do that some of the time when, when lactose is actually present. Well, that's the same with eukaryotes in some genes. Some genes only need to be expressed when certain things are actually present in the environment or when certain things need to be done. However, on the other hand, some genes need to be expressed more constantly. And that's the same for prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So, for example, all cells carry out respiration. So all cells need to be constantly transcribing the genes that are responsible for creating the enzymes that are involved in respiration. However, there's some big differences between eukaryotic organisms and prokaryotic organisms. And that causes differences in the way that they control their genes. So one of the first biggest differences between many eukaryotes and prokaryotic cells are the fact that eukaryotes often have specialized cells. So for example, a human will have nerve cells, brain cells, sorry, nerve cells, muscle cells, white blood cells, and so on. And the picture on the the image on the screen right now will actually show you a few of those. They're specialized cells that all do specialized jobs. Now that's different from prokaryote cells because prokaryote cells obviously they're a single celled organism so they have one cell that does everything. So the DNA in a prokaryote will be responsible for creating the proteins that that the cell needs for all the different processes. So looking at the screen now we can see different types of cells. We can see at the top left of the screen we've got bone cells, top right we've got muscle cells, then on the bottom right we've got white blood cells and on the bottom left we've got nerve cell there. Now, basically, what we're really saying here is that eukaryotes are made of lots of different types of cells. So one specific cell will have a specific set of jobs that it actually carries out. However, as you know, each of those cells all has the same copy of DNA. So the question really is, how can one cell, like a white blood cell, be completely different in the way it looks and the job it does to, for example, a nerve cell? And that's where this idea of eukaryote gene control comes in. So some genes are turned off and some genes are turned on. For example, the cells that make up the pancreas might be responsible for producing insulin. So the insulin genes in the pancreatic cells will be turned on because the pancreatic cells need to produce insulin. However, if you compare that with, say, the cells in the stomach lining that produce things like uh, hydrochloric acid, the genes that are involved in that process will be turned on while the insulin genes will be turned off. And the opposite will be said for the pancreatic cells. So basically, it's the turning on and off genes that basically leads to those differences in what the cell does and also the way it looks and the way it's structured. And if we're looking at those four different types of cell there on the screen, each of those is different due to the type of gene expression that's actually going on. Some genes are turned off while other genes are turned on. So I've already said that uh, eukaryotes don't have operons, so let's start to have a quick look at what processes are actually involved, what mechanisms are actually involved in turning a gene on and off in a eukaryote. Well, the first big distinction is that in a eukaryote there is no operator, so there is no sort of switch like there is in a prokaryote cell, and it is a little bit more complicated. 
So there's actually proteins involved in controlling eukaryote gene expression and those proteins are called transcription factors and that's something that we've not come across before so let's have a quick talk about what actually is a transcription factor. Well like I've already said a transcription factor is a protein. It's believed there's about 2,600 of these transcription factors that actually exist in humans and like all other proteins they're actually made by genes so that uh, a cell actually has sections of DNA that actually code for these proteins, code for these transcription factors. And it's been estimated that about 10% of the genes that we have actually code for transcription factors. Now it seems that different types of cell actually have different transcription factors present. And it also seems that the transcription factors actually have a part of them that actually is able to bind to the DNA. And different transcription factors bind to different parts of the DNA. So those cells that are in the um, pancreas, for example, might have transcription factors present that actually bind to the parts of DNA around where the genes are involved in creating insulin. And they bind to those parts of the DNA and also bind to RNA polymerase to actually encourage that gene to be transcribed. However, at the same time in the pancreatic cell, the transcription factors responsible for the process of creating hydrochloric acid won't be present, so that gene, or those genes involved in making hydrochloric acid, won't be transcribed. So let's have a bit of a more detailed look at how transcription factors are actually involved in promoting transcription of a gene. Now to do that we need to start by looking at a eukaryote gene and the different parts of the gene, just like we did with the prokaryote. So if you just have a quick look at the image on your screen, we can start talking through that. So the band going across the middle of the screen there is the section of DNA, and there's two main parts of that DNA that we need to know about. The first one on the left is the enhancer region and the second one on the right is what we call the promoter region which is similar to the prokaryote gene control. So think for a second, what do you think happens at the promoter region? Well I'm hoping you've managed to sort of figure out that it's the same as the prokaryote gene control and the promoter region is where the RNA polymerase will attach and begin to that process of transcription. Now the enhancer region though is something new so let's have a quick look at what that is. Well basically it's another section of DNA that's involved in speeding up or slowing down the transcription of a gene and it's a region of DNA that can be found thousands of base pairs upstream or downstream from the actual gene that's uh, being transcribed. And as we'll see in a second it's vital to this control of gene expression in eukaryotes. So how do transcription factors fit in here? Well let's just talk about what would need to happen to increase the transcription of a particular gene. Well, first of all, the right transcription factors would need to be present in the cell. So let's say we're in a pancreatic cell, a cell in the pancreas. The transcription factors for insulin would need to be present. And because it's a pancreatic cell, it's a specialized cell that does that job, those transcription factors would be present. Now, those transcription factors that are specific to speeding up the production of insulin would bind on to the enhancer sequence, as shown in the left of the diagram. And then other transcription factors that are required for RNA polymerase to bind onto any gene start binding onto the promoter region and onto RNA polymerase itself. Now once those things have happened, the actual DNA actually starts to change its shape. And the promoter region and the enhancer regions actually move close together until eventually they're touching. And if you look at the image on your screen now, you'll see the start of that process. Now when they're touching, we say that the DNA has formed what we call a hairpin loop. And if you imagine the enhancer and promoter regions you can see on your screen now moving close enough together so they're actually touching, you can see the hairpin loop would be the section of DNA that's been formed between those two regions. Once that's actually happened, RNA polymerase can then start transcribing the gene. But it doesn't happen before the promoter and enhancer regions actually bond together. And that doesn't happen until the transcription factors bind to both the enhancer regions and the promoter regions and RNA polymerase itself. So I'm hoping that's given you a bit of an idea of the processes involved in this and the molecules and what they do. But I think really to get a proper understanding we'll actually have to think about an example of this actually working in action. Um, so I'm going to do a really quick podcast that's going to accompany this one. It should be on the wiki space, on my YouTube account, and plenty of time for you to do this. Um, and it'll just go through a particular example of this actually happening. And hopefully it will illustrate it a little bit easier for you. But remember... Anything you don't understand from this video, please make a note of it and write a question on the wiki space so that your classmates can help you out and I can find out which bits you don't know so I know what to do in class. So, once again guys, thanks again for listening. Keep it real and I'll speak to you soon.